Here we're looking at a solution to question A3 from the 2011 Putnam exam. So our goal is to find real numbers C and L, where L is positive, such that when we take the limit as R goes to infinity of R to the C times the integral from zero to pi over two X to the R sine X dx, divided by the integral from zero to pi over two of X to the R cosine X dx, we get L. So I'm gonna give you guys some hints so you can maybe try this problem real quick before we look at a solution. And the first hint is to use the squeeze theorem. In other words, somehow get this guy in the middle here, in this limit in between two objects for which it's easy to find their limit. And another thing is integration by parts. And I just wanna point out that this kind of integral in the numerator and this integral in the denominator are easily translatable into each other via integration by parts. So just think about maybe using that. Okay, so now maybe give this problem a go and we'll come back with a solution. So hopefully those hints were helpful. Now we're gonna look at a full solution starting with playing around with this integral in the numerator. And we wanna do that by using kind of an obvious bound of the sine function. So maybe the first thing to observe is that if x is on the closed interval zero to pi over two, it's important to look there because those are our limits of integration. We have sine of x. Well, that's most definitely less than or equal to one. Well, that's clear everywhere but then it's bigger than or equal to the following linear function given by two over pi times x. Now you can check this pretty easily using like first semester calculus, but the idea here is that if you were to graph these two things, so let's maybe put this point right here is pi over two, the sine function has a nice arc to it like this, so this would be the point along the y-axis of one. But then this is just a linear function with slope two over pi. So this guy looks something like this. So notice this linear function here is below the purple function, which is the sine. And then furthermore, um, we could put just the vertical, sorry, the horizontal line, which is y equals one at the top. So that's kind of a picture of this inequality. Okay, great. Now we wanna mold this inequality into something that looks like this numerator here. So let's go ahead and do that. So first of all, we can multiply by x to the r and we will maintain this inequality. And so that's um, definitely true because we're letting x tend towards infinity here. So you can think about x as being very, very large. So that's gonna tell us that we have two over pi to the x times x to the r plus one will be less than or equal to x to the r times sine x, which is less than or equal to x to the r. Great. Now we can integrate all parts of this and we still maintain this inequality. But before we do that, let's introduce some notation. Let's say that a sub r is equal to the integral from zero to pi over two of x to the r times sine x dx, just so that we don't have to keep writing that over and over and over again. Okay, so now if we integrate all parts of this inequality, that gives us the following. So we have the integral from zero to pi halves of two over pi x to the r plus one dx, and that's less than or equal to a sub r. That's what we set equal to the integral involving the sine function, but then that's less than or equal to the integral from zero to pi halves of x to the r dx. Now we can easily evaluate those integrals on either side. So I'll do that real quickly. So notice here we'll get one over r plus one x to the r plus one evaluated at pi over two and zero. So that's gonna give us one over r plus one times pi over two to the r plus one. Great. And now here we'll have one over r plus two, x to the r plus two evaluated at pi over two and zero, but then we're multiplying that by a two over pi. So that's gonna kinda cancel things down a little bit and we'll have one over r plus two and then pi over two to the r plus one. So we have this same exponent in the pi over two. Okay, so now we're kinda running out of room. I'll go ahead and bring this up and we'll keep going. 
So in the last board, we set the integral in the numerator involving sine equal to a sub r, and then we found these bounds for a sub r. So it was bound below by one over r plus two times pi over two to the r plus one, and it was bound above by one over r plus one times pi over two to the r plus one. Now what we'd like to do is play around with this integral in the denominator, and what we'll see is via integration by parts, we can uh, manipulate this until it looks something like this integral in the numerator. So let's go ahead and see that. So we're gonna look at the integral from zero to pi halves of x to the r cos x dx. Now the standard for integration by parts is you let u equal the polynomial part, and so this would be the x to the r part, and then you would let dv equal the transcendental part, so this would be the cosine x dx part. So let's just see how that goes. That's gonna make du equal to r times x to the r minus one dx, and that's gonna let v equal to sine x, good. And then again, just recall real quick that our integration by parts formula is the integral of u dv equals uv minus the integral of v du. So that's gonna give us u times v, so that's x to the r times sine x evaluated from zero to pi halves. And then we'll have minus v du, so that's gonna be minus r, and then the integral from zero to pi over two of x to the r minus one times sine of x dx. Great. So we succeeded in getting back to something that looks like this a sub r integral, but notice that this term right here will not disappear. If we plug in pi over two, we'll have pi over two to the r. Now that may be fine and it may be workable, but perhaps we can make a better choice. So I'll go ahead and erase this and let's see what we get if we do the opposite integration by parts. So we just did the standard integration by parts and we ended up with something that looked like it was gonna turn into a mess. So let's try a non-standard integration by parts. So I'll let u equal this trigonometric part, cosine of x, and then I'll let dv equal this polynomial part, in other words, x to the r dx. Now generally we don't do this because you would wanna choose u so that when you take its derivative it gets simpler but that's exactly the opposite of how we've chosen it. But perhaps it'll work better in this case. Okay, so let's run through the calculation. So we'll have du equals minus sine of x dx, and then we'll have v equals one over r plus one, x to the r plus one. Great. So let's see what that gives us. Again, using the u times v minus integral of v du formula, we have one over r plus one, x to the r plus one times cos x. We need to evaluate that from zero to pi halves. And then next, we have the integral of v du. We have to subtract that, but we have a minus sign built in. So that's gonna be plus one over r plus one. And then we have the integral from zero to pi halves of x to the r plus one times sine of x dx. So maybe this isn't better, but I think it is because notice if we plug pi over two into cosine, we get zero. Then if we plug zero into this guy, we get zero. So that means this whole term cancels. And then we've achieved just a multiple of a sub r plus one. So we have one over r plus one, a sub r plus one. Great. So now what I'll do is I'll go ahead and bring that to the top and we'll move on to the next step. So on the last board we used integration by parts to transform our denominator integral into something that looks like our numerator integral. So I've renamed this denominator integral b sub r and we showed that that was equal to one over r plus one times a sub r plus one. Now I wanna build a similar inequality for this b sub r integral, keeping in mind that in our goal limit, it shows up in the denominator. So what I really need is some sort of inequality involving one over b sub r. Great, so again, keeping in mind that that is really r plus one over a sub r. So let's maybe go ahead and write that right here. This is r plus one over a sub r plus one, great. So that means our one over b sub r term 
will be bound below by the reciprocal of this, where we've replaced r with r plus one times r plus one. So let's just write that down and then we'll talk our way through it. So that's gonna be r plus one from this guy right here. Now the reciprocal of that, that's gonna put an r plus two up because we need to increase the index by one given the fact that we're working with a sub r plus one instead of a sub r. And then next we have two over pi to the r plus two. Great. So we've got that is what's bounding it below and then bounding it above, we can play a similar game. So we'll increase all the indices of this by one as we reciprocate and we'll multiply by this r plus one. So that's gonna give us an r plus one times an r plus three times a two over pi to the r plus two. Good. Now the next thing that I wanna do is notice my goal is to find not the limit of a r over BR, but it is RC times AR over BR, and we can tweak that C so that the limit exists. So let's maybe go ahead and do that. So notice we've got R to the C times A sub R over B sub R. So notice that's exactly the expression with which I'm trying to find the limit. So that's gonna be bound above by the product of this guy and this guy. So notice the R plus ones cancel, and we're gonna have R to the C times R plus three, and then notice the pi over two and the two over pi stuff cancels down to just be two over pi. Great. And then notice bound below, it's gonna be the product of this thing which is bounding our a sub r below, this thing which is bounding our one over b sub r below, and r sub c, so notice the r plus twos cancel, and we get r to the c times r plus one, and then another two over pi. So one of the last things to notice is that the limit of this bottom function and the limit of this top function exist and are the same if c is equal to negative one. So let's maybe notice that. So if c equals negative one, we have the limit as r approaches infinity of r to the c times r plus one times two over pi will be equal to two over pi, just from like first semester calculus. But then that's also going to be equal to the limit of the top thing. So in other words, the r to the c times r plus three. So the limit is r goes to infinity, r c, r plus three, two over pi. That's also going to be equal to two over pi. But what that tells us is that the limit as r goes to infinity of r to the c times a sub r over b sub r, which is our goal limit, will also be equal to two to the pi because it's squeezed be between two things that limit to two to the pi. So the answer here in the end is that c must be equal to negative one and l is equal to two over pi. Great, and that's a good place to stop.